We're glad to have a presentation by Matthew Leonard, who's a very popular speaker, author, filmmaker, and founder of the Science of Sainthood, which is an online community teaching authentic Catholic spirituality. It can be found at scienceofsainthood.com. Hi, my name is Matthew Leonard. I'm a Catholic author and evangelist and the founder of the scienceofsainthood.com, where I teach authentic Catholic spirituality. What I'd like to talk to you about today is something I think we desperately need during these dark days. As we all know, storm clouds have been gathering around us for quite some time, and a spiritual tempest is beginning to unleash its power. Things have gotten a little scary. Even so, this is not the time for us to simply run for shelter. Remember, the church has been in a battle from day one. And after all, we're not just fighting against this or that politician or this or that group or corporation. We're fighting against the evil one. And it's a fight that takes place not just in the natural realm, but in the supernatural realm. That's why St. Paul declared, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And since we're fighting a spiritual battle, we need spiritual weapons. And one of the weapons in our spiritual arsenal that is extremely powerful is one that is often ignored. But it's a shame because it can effectively squash the power of the evil one and help us keep our eyes focused on Christ. What is it? It's the virtue of hope. And as I said, it's a weapon in virtue we often overlook, even though it has incredible power and can transform our lives. While faith and charity often get tons of attention, and not without good reason, the virtue of hope is ridiculously important, as we're going to see. But, as I said, it's kind of like the third wheel of the theological virtues. It's kind of the forgotten guy. And we all know what that feels like, don't we? Back in the 90s, I was flying to Europe with my best friend and his not yet official girlfriend. We were on our way to a study abroad semester in Austria during graduate school. Well, the problem was that these two friends were still at the stage of making so many googly eyes at each other that just being around them made you want to vomit out your guts. And worse yet, they didn't seem to notice my disgust. I might as well have been invisible, like one of the Jackson 5 not named Michael. Of course, I suppose that since they're now married with a house full of kids and their firstborn is my godson, well, I can't complain too much. But in spite of their best efforts to not perpetually get all Debbie Gibson lost in your eyes, for a large part of the time we traipsed around Europe, I totally felt like a third wheel. And I think this is sometimes how the theological virtue of hope feels. Like a little kid who never gets the right shotgun, it's often relegated to the back seat. But hope is huge. In fact, as we're going to see, hope is kind of the glue between faith and love and is absolutely vital as we make our way to heaven in the midst of the cultural cesspool of this world. Now, I don't want to make the world sound too terrible, but let's be honest. None of us are actually living in Mayberry with Andy Griffith these days. While sin has always been hanging around, in just a few short years, the world has gone absolutely nuts. So... We need some hope because realize that without hope, we got nothing to live for. We might as well hang it all up. Now, that said, we also have to realize that hope isn't just about the distant future. It's about the here and now as well. St. Bernard of Clairvaux says, Place all your hope in the heart of Jesus. It is a safe asylum. For he who trusts in God is sheltered and protected by his mercy. To this firm hope, Join the practice of virtue, and even in this life, you will begin to taste the ineffable joys of paradise. So, the virtue of hope helps us to even find peace in the present moment. Like when you're at a music recital and during small children screeching and sawing violins in half to the point where neighborhood dogs are checking themselves into the kennel so as to find peace. Hope is what helps you make it to the intermission. So even when we're enduring severe hardship, if we know we're moving toward a goal, striving for a final end in which there is no more pain or suffering, hope gives us strength to carry on. In fact, suffering and hope are so tied together 
their relationship is kind of a two-way street. As St. Paul declares in Romans 5, suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. And character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. In other words, suffering love produces hope. And as we're going to see, hope fuels that same love. And not only does hope play a pivotal role in helping us endure earthly hardship, it has a vital spiritual role as well. And part of that, says Pope Benedict XVI, is because there's an intimate connection not just between love and hope, but also between the virtues of faith and hope. So much so, he says, that sacred scripture sometimes seems to use them interchangeably. For example, Benedict says Hebrews 10, 22 to 23 links faith and hope very closely when it says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings and hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. So the author of Hebrews, and probably St. Paul, connects the full assurance that faith brings and holding unswervingly to the hope we profess. In other words, faith and hope are ordered to the same goal. They're performing similar and complementary functions. Now, why is this important? Why does Pope Benedict focus on this? Well, for one thing, He's trying to show us that hope isn't just some pie in the sky feeling. He's showing us that it's a virtue that actually performs something. It's transformative. In fact, St. Thomas Aquinas tells us it lives in the upstairs, more spiritual part of the soul. Particularly, it resides in the will. As we all know, a willful child is not a wallflower. He's the kid imposing himself on others. And in a sense, that's what hope does. It imposes itself on us and helps change us from the inside out. Realize that beginning with baptism, our encounter with Christ doesn't just give us faith in Him, but an ardent virtue of hope that one day we'll be with Him forever in heaven. It gives a kind of supernatural surety that transforms our lives. And that's so important. I mean, seriously. It's almost impossible to move through this life without hope. How does anybody do it? A hopeless existence is one of despair. Everybody has to hope in something. The problem is that all too often we put our hope in the wrong place. We put our hope in money, power, or even other people, and we're always disappointed. Why? Because only God in His great mercy has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You see, this is one of the most distinguishing marks of the Christian faith. We have a distinct hope in the future that doesn't involve this world. While we might not know exactly what awaits us, we have supernatural hope that life will not end in emptiness. Christian hope orients us to a final, eternal end. It shows us that there is something incredible to live for, something beyond us in our paltry existence. And yes, we don't know all the exact details, but we know it's going to be amazing. It's going to be something so far beyond what we can imagine that St. Paul says, no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Now, sometimes when my kids are watching a movie with a lot of computer graphics of some future world, they're like, oh man, it would be so cool to live in a place like that. And I often remind them that if some long-haired dude dressed in jeans and flip-flops in a cubicle in Hollywood can come up with a cool world like that on his iPad, imagine how incredible the God of the universe has made heaven. And don't let the modern portrayals of heaven fool you. We're not going to sit around all day on clouds with half-naked cherubs strumming harps. That's a lie perpetrated by the evil one who wants our eyes on the shallow glitz and glamour of this world. He wants heaven to appear boring. Why? Because he's fully aware that if we had even the smallest inkling of the divine life that awaits us, we'd run after it as fast and as hard as we possibly could and never give the supposed allure of this world a second glance. As St. Paul declared to the Philippians, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. 
Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as refuse in order that I may gain Christ. But as I said, the virtue of hope doesn't just turn our gaze toward eternity. The good news of Christ and the hope it brings actually does something to us. As Pope Benedict says, the gospel is not merely a communication of things that can be known. It is one that makes things happen and is life-changing. The dark door of time, of the future, has been thrown open. The one who has hope lives differently. The one who hopes has been granted the gift of a new life. Activating our will, hope frees us from the chains that bind us. It empowers us to crush the sin that wreaks havoc in our lives. How? By making us want to strive for the object of our hope. And I'm not just talking about heaven. I'm talking about something deeper, something more intrinsic to humanity. I'm talking about love. Everybody wants to be loved. Everybody needs to be loved. Why else would Debbie Gibson's Lost in Your Eyes ever reach number one in the Billboard charts? Not to mention a zillion other songs about love. It's because we all want love. But the infused virtue of hope elevates our desire for love to a completely different level. It fills us with the sure knowledge that we are loved by the divine other who made us, along with the desire to be united to that love. Hope recognizes that the God of the universe, who is love, adores us to no end and makes us want to fling ourselves into that abyss of love. In other words, the theological virtues don't exist in a vacuum. They're all interrelated. Faith puts us in contact with God, which gives us hope. Why? Because we are loved. In his beautiful encyclical, Space Salvi, Saved in Hope, Pope Benedict tells the incredible story of St. Josephine Bakita. Born in the late 1860s in Africa, she was kidnapped at the age of nine by slave traders. Beaten daily and constantly abused, she was repeatedly bought and sold until finally she ended up in Europe. And it was there, says the Holy Father, that she encountered a new loving master, one who himself had been willingly flogged and abused and now waited for her at the right hand of the Father. Now she had hope, says Pope Benedict, no longer simply the modest hope of finding masters who would be less cruel, but the great hope. I am definitely loved, she said, and whatever happens to me, I am awaited by this love, and so my life is good. So. Do you see the transformative power of hope? It's not just some kind of wishing upon a star feeling. It's real. It changes us. It reorients our worldview so that we see things in light of our eternal destiny and helps us live for that end. So in a very real way, we can say that hope redeems us. Why? Because our hope is ultimately in Jesus Christ, who has conquered death and offers us eternal life and love. Colossians 1.27 says, Christ in us is the hope of glory. The hope that filled the heart of Josephine Bakita led her to understand that regardless of her situation in life, she was truly redeemed, free to be a true child of God. And instead of returning to the Sudan when she had the opportunity, she chose to remain in Europe, being baptized, confirmed, and receiving Holy Communion from the hands of the Patriarch of Venice, himself. In fact, eventually, she even took religious vows, often traveling through Italy teaching the hope in Christ that had truly liberated her entire being. St. Josephine knew that at the end of the day, there is no real hope outside of God. As St. Paul said to the Ephesians, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, having no hope and without God in the world. In other words, Paul was saying, look guys, when you were without God, your life was pointless. It was without hope. And this is our reality as well. Think about all the silly distractions with which we've filled our lives in the past. Think about all the bright lights and baubles we sought. 
We've all wasted so much time chasing this or that thing outside of God to some degree or another. I mean, even when we caught them, so to speak, they never did anything for us. They never filled us up. The hope we had for some kind of satisfaction just never materialized. Why? Well, because God alone is our hope. He alone is our salvation. So if we just keep our eyes on Him, everything would be fine. And yes, I'm fully aware that the world is going to hell in a handbasket, and oftentimes things look bleak. I mean, the rise of evil has been nothing short of breathtaking on many fronts. Things look bad. But don't forget the promise of Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And yes, I realize that prophecy is ultimately about the hope of our heavenly home, but it was also an important prophecy on an earthly level that should fill us with hope that no matter how bad things look, God is in control and that one day, Things can turn around even in this world. Why? Well, don't forget that Jeremiah was prophesying at a pretty terrible time. The great Old Testament prophet was writing to the Jewish captives in Babylon who'd been taken into exile in 586 BC by King Nebuchadnezzar. They were essentially slaves living a long way from home. But that wasn't even the half of it. Their entire city had been demolished, and the center of their life and worship, the Jerusalem temple, had been laid waste. Jeremiah himself had hidden the Ark of the Covenant, the very throne of God, right before the Babylonians invaded. And nobody but him, and eventually Indiana Jones, knew where it was. And you have to understand that the absence of the Ark meant the absence of the presence of God. It would be like walking into a forever empty adoration chapel, except that the Israelites couldn't even walk into the building because it was gone. As I said, the Babylonians had utterly destroyed the Jerusalem temple. And this was devastating because it was the only place they could offer sacrifice. So even if they escaped, there was little to which they could even return. And yet, Jeremiah stood up and basically said, in spite of everything you see, have hope. God knows what you're experiencing, and He will be faithful to deliver you. And not only that, but He's got great plans for you. And He was so right. Seventy years later, the exiles returned to their homeland, rebuilding the city and the temple. Once again, they were able to call upon the name of the Lord in sacrifice and worship. In the face of overwhelming earthly odds, their hope had been rewarded. And it's the same for us. No matter how bleak the circumstances, God is always present. He not only knows every situation, every issue, and every trial we face, He's in control of it. In other words, our hope is never in vain. After all, if God is for us, who is against us? Asks St. Paul. The God of the universe has already put in writing that He will deliver us and grant us a future and a hope. But a big question remains. If hope is so vital to the strengthening of our desire for God and amending our lives so that we can ascend to Him, how do we increase it? How do we grow in hope? Well, Pope Benedict XVI again provides the answer. And it's an answer that shouldn't surprise anyone who has studied the spiritual life. The first essential setting for learning hope is prayer, says the Pope. When no one listens to me anymore, God still listens to me. When I can no longer talk to anyone or call upon anyone, I can always talk to God. When there is no longer anyone to help me deal with a need or expectation that goes beyond the human capacity of hope, He can help me. When I have been plunged into complete solitude, if I pray, I am never totally alone. Prayer is so key that Benedict calls it the school of hope. And it totally makes sense. Being able to cry out to Almighty God means there is always someone with whom you can talk. There's always someone there. God is always listening. In fact, He's always waiting for us to enter into that conversation with Him. 
Now, I want you to step back and think about how crazy that is. You wouldn't even dream of picking up the phone and immediately reaching the CEO of Apple, IBM, or some other multinational corporation, would you? You'd be hard pressed to get the owner of your local grocery store on the line for crying out loud. But the God of the universe puts himself constantly at our disposal. Like a blondie disc on constant repeat, our father is saying, call me, call me anytime. Why? Well, because he wants to talk to us. He wants us to engage him. And we do that through prayer. If you're not praying, you're nuts. Why? Well, because if you're not praying, you're not talking to the person who loves you more than anyone else. And realize that when I say prayer, I don't just mean asking God for stuff. That's the attitude of a child who is only focused on their own needs. I want this. I want that. Please give me more. Real Catholic prayer is so much deeper. It's relationship with God. In fact, if you ever really sat back and recognized that prayer is literally what you're made for, and think about it. We are destined for eternal union with Him. That's the goal. In heaven, we'll experience a level of divine intimacy with the Lord that words cannot express. It's an ecstatic relationship that goes beyond words because it's relationship with the divine other who made us. But that relationship doesn't simply start once we break on through to the other side. Unless you're in Las Vegas, a couple doesn't typically meet each other for the first time and then head to the airport for their honeymoon. Well, similarly, we don't simply jump into an ecstatic relationship with God after a few, I need these and can you help me's. Just like our human relationships need time and attention so as to grow, so does our relationship with God. And realize, the life of prayer is not optional. When you read through the saints, one of the things they make very clear is that all things being equal, if you don't have a life of prayer, you're not going to make it to heaven. St. Alphonsus Liguori said that short of a miracle, a person who doesn't practice mental prayer will end up in mortal sin. In another place, he quotes St. Thomas Aquinas, who declared, after baptism, continual prayer is necessary to man in order that he may enter heaven. When you stand before the Lord at your personal judgment, He's not going to quiz you on this or that Bible passage or this or that dogma. While those things are obviously important and help you to know and love God, they're not part of the final test, so to speak. When we stand face to face with Jesus, He's going to look us in the eye and ask, Do you love me? Do I know you? He's going to question whether or not we have a relationship with Him. And if you don't have a real life of prayer, the answer is no. You don't. And just like you wouldn't consider someone who never spoke to you a friend, the Lord will not consider us his friends if we never pray, if we never talk to him. And that's one of the reasons that prayer is singled out by Pope Benedict as the essential setting for hope. You see, prayer is our defense against the two sins that undermine hope, despair and presumption. How? Well, talking regularly to God reminds us that we're not alone. So there's no reason to despair. God is always with us. At some point or another, we've all been in a situation in which we feel hopeless. Every avenue of relief has been explored. Every solution has been sought, but to no avail. So what do we do? We cry out to God. We seek the help of the one who holds the whole world in his hands. And the fact that we trust that God can hear us is a defense against despair. Of course, Prayer is what we should have been doing in the first place. It's not our last resort, it's our first resort. If more people turn to prayer first, there'd be far less despair. And prayer guards against the second sin that undermines hope as well, presumption. Because crying out to God appropriately places us in the role of children. It reminds us that we can't do anything on our own. We are completely and totally dependent on God. We can't even blink without His help. But you know what? There's an even deeper relationship between prayer and hope. So many of the great saints and sacred scripture itself continuously point to something which is at the heart and soul of what I teach in the science of sainthood. They constantly remind us that we are created for union with God, a true participation in His divinity, as St. Athanasius declared, 
God became man so that man might become God. No matter how many times I hear that, it always blows my mind. Through grace, God gives us the ability to become what He is by nature, divine. And we obviously don't become equal to Him because He is God and we are simply His creatures. But He made us for His divine family. And the only way we can truly be a part of His divine family is if we are divine like the rest of the family. Otherwise, we're not really a part of them. You may love your pet turtle Sasquatch and refer to him as an adopted member of the family, but the reality is that that's not possible. He can't be. He isn't really human like the rest of the family. In other words, the turtle doesn't share the same nature as the rest of the family. But compare that to an actual human baby that's adopted into a family. Since it shares the same human nature as the rest of the family, it can become part of the family in a way that an animal never can. And that's exactly what happens with God and us. We were created by God to be members of His divine family. But we can't achieve that unless we become divine like the rest of the family. Of course, we can't make that happen on our own. So God does it for us. His gift of love is to allow us to become partakers of His divine nature, says 2 Peter 1.4. In other words, He shares His divinity with us and makes us really, truly His children. As 1 John 3 declares, See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as He is pure." Look, this is the ultimate gift. This is the public secret of the Catholic faith that we should be shouting from the rooftops. We are literally deified by God so that we can become true members of His divine family. But the sad reality is, is that we don't want it enough. We don't desire the greatest gift we could ever receive. Our hearts are too small. And again, this is part of the power of prayer. St. Augustine says that prayer is actually an exercise of desire. By patiently seeking God in prayer, and not just praying for stuff we want and need, but constantly seeking Him through meditative prayer in particular, our desire for God is increased. We are stretched. By delaying His gift, says Augustine, God strengthens our desire. Through desire, He enlarges our soul. And by expanding it, He increases its capacity for receiving Him. So the hard work of fighting our earthly inclinations and seeking God in prayer purifies us. It enlarges our heart and opens us up more to God and to others. And the more our heart is purified and enlarged, the more we desire and hope in Him. Prayer purifies our desires so that we want God more than anything else. It makes us realize more and more that ultimately our hope lies in Him alone. It acts like a filter, cleansing us and sifting out the garbage that damages our spiritual lives so that we become not just hopeful, but full of great hope. And not only does it give us hope, it makes us ministers of hope to others as well. And this needs to happen. Why are so many people leaving the faith? Well, it's because they've never encountered real hope. Their lack of prayerful intimacy with God has left their spirit cold and barren. And this can happen even to practicing Catholics. You can do all the right things, like have the perfect liturgy, know all the apologetic answers, sell out of the 50-50 raffle tickets at the fish fry, whatever. But if the fire of love has not been ignited in your heart by the beautiful hope of life in and with Jesus Christ, you're going to fall away. You're going to be like the seed that grew up quickly and withered away in Christ's parable of the sower. The Catholic Church is going to convert the world when more of us have stoked the flames of love in our hearts through prayer. That intimacy with God can't help but fill our hearts with supernatural hope that overflows out of our lives and into others. The baptism plants the seeds of hope which need to grow and bear fruit in our lives. 
fruit that needs to feed hope in the lives of others. That's how evangelization is done. And spiritual theologian Father Adolphe Tanqueré points out that the relationship between hope and prayer is a two-way street. While prayer inflames our hope, hope strengthens our prayers so they achieve the intended result. Know ye that no one hath hoped in the Lord and hath been confounded, says Sirach chapter 2. For who hath continued in his commandment and hath been forsaken? Or who hath called upon him and he despised him? For God is compassionate and merciful and will forgive sins in the day of tribulation. And if you're wondering why I use that old English version, it's because I like the way it translates the passage, not to mention the fact that it's so fun to say, know ye. It's like the medieval version of y'all. But the point of Sirach is that hope leads to a confidence and trust that God will always take care of us. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask anything of the Father, he will give it to you in my name, says Christ in John 16, 23. And the virtue of hope doesn't just empower our prayers and give us confidence they'll be heard. It actually gives us holy desires. It's like a giant bellow that stokes the fire of our desire to possess God and gives us the energy to do it. When we step back and reflect on the stupendous offer God is making, our hope for that glory gives us the desire to seek it, to strive after it. It helps us to keep an eternal perspective and not be so weighed down by suffering and strife. And it works like that because the virtue of faith gives us assurance that our hope is real. So again, we see how the virtues are connected. Faith kicks into gear and says that God is real. Heaven is real. Divine life is real. It gives us a certainty of triumph as long as our hope is in the Lord. Even were the entire world to rise up to destroy us, declares St. Vincent de Paul, it could do nothing but what is pleasing to God, in whom we have placed our hope. When things don't seem to be going our way, our hope must remain firm. The reality is that God's in control no matter what, and He always has our best interest at heart, even when something bad happens. Echoing Romans 8.28, St. Vincent de Paul reminds us, all that God does, he does for the best. And therefore, we must hope that this loss, since it comes from God, will be profitable to us. If we really believe that God is our good and perfect Heavenly Father, why wouldn't we trust him? Does he want us to be happy in the here and now? Absolutely. As St. Bernard of Clairvaux says, place all your hope in the heart of Jesus. It is a safe asylum, for he who trusts in God is sheltered and protected by his mercy. To this firm hope, join the practice of virtue, and even in this life, you will begin to taste the ineffable joys of paradise. But even so, like any good parent, God isn't just thinking about our present situation. He is primarily concerned with our future, our eternal future. Like, hoping God doesn't mean bad things aren't going to happen. We all know they're going to happen one way or the other. That's the result of original sin. The virtue of hope gives everything over to the Lord and says, I know you're going to take care of all of this, Lord. So hope fills us with the trust of a child that his parent is going to protect, keep, and bless him. And this knowledge doesn't just lift us up when we're down. It helps us detach ourselves from the trappings of worldly success even in good times, which in many ways can be more deadly than difficult times. Every one of us knows, or should know from experience, that fame and fortune and power, along with everything else in this world, is fleeting. Nothing in this world will last, and none of it can hold a candle to the hope of eternity with God. To be with Jesus is a sweet paradise, says the imitation of Christ. The virtue of hope places our heart in heaven and says, stay and don't look down. As the old collect for the Feast of the Ascension prayed, amid the changing things of this world, may our hearts be fixed where true joy is found. This brings up one final point. Like the theological virtue of faith, hope doesn't exist in heaven. 
St. Thomas Aquinas says that faith is necessary because right now we have imperfect knowledge of God. But once we're with him, our knowledge will be perfected and there's no need for faith. Well, similarly, once we get to heaven, we've achieved that for which we hoped. We've arrived. Our hope is in the Lord. And once in heaven, we're fully united to him. So hope only exists on earth and in purgatory. But since you and I have not yet arrived, we have to strengthen our hope. It's our lifeline to eternity and a true gift from God that always reminds us of the glory that awaits us if we're willing to live our lives for the Lord of heaven and earth. And with that in mind, I'd like to invite you to try something. For the last few years, I've dedicated myself to teaching people how to fortify their hope, strengthen their prayer life, and grow in every other aspect of the Catholic spiritual life. Now, focusing on deep prayer and the rest of authentic Catholic spirituality absolutely transformed my life and lit a fire so hot in my soul that I have a really hard time not talking about it. And the reason why is because I finally focused on what Christ himself calls the one thing necessary in Luke 10. So you and I are made for nothing less than divine intimacy. We're made for a relationship with Jesus Christ that makes everything else pale in comparison. But most of us have no idea how to achieve it. That's why I created scienceofsainthood.com. It's well over a hundred professional video lessons, meditations, passages from scriptures and the saints that walk you step by step down the path to sainthood, down the path toward what you were made to be, a true child of God in his divine family. The science of sainthood goes way beyond anything you've ever experienced as far as the spiritual life is concerned. It's basically everything you should have been taught but probably never were. Now, does it cost money? Yeah, it's my full-time job and I've got six children, so I had to charge something. But I've also made the first 24 lessons totally free for you to watch for a couple of weeks. No credit card, no strings, no nothing. Just transformative spiritual formation that will change your life. If you're in the United States, you can simply text the word SAINT to the number 66866 or anyone, no matter where you live, can just go to scienceofsainthood.com and sign up. You'll receive an email with a free login and password in your inbox, and that's it. You're in. Now, over the two-week free trial, you'll get some emails asking if you want to go further and join the entire Science of Sainthood. If you don't, no worries. Your access will simply expire. You don't have to cancel anything. Now, if you do want to continue, you'll find a world of spiritual teaching and enrichment that will leave you in awe of God's incredible gift to you. So, there you go. Two free weeks of the science of sainthood that can change your life. But, regardless of whether or not you dive into the spiritual life through the science of sainthood or somewhere else, you have to dive in. It's an absolute must. It's the only way any of us is going to make it through this world in one piece. The evil one's going to do anything and everything he can to derail and destroy you. And the only way you can protect yourself, your family, and anyone around you is to lead by example. There is no time to be mediocre. Spiritual mediocrity is what put us in the position we're in. But a return to a focus upon holiness, a return to an authentic life of prayer in the spiritual life will put us in a position to be used by God to right the ship and transform lives. That should be our focus and our hope. Wait upon the Lord says St. Bernard of Clairvaux. Be faithful to his commandments. He will elevate your hope and put you in possession of his kingdom. Wait upon him patiently. Wait upon him by avoiding all sin. He will come, doubt it not. And in the approaching day of his visitation, which will be that of your death and his judgment, he will himself crown your holy hope. Don't ever stop thanking God for the hope He extends to you at every moment. It is the power to transform you into His very likeness and be united with His unfathomable love. So, along with St. Paul, I pray, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. God bless you.